other than to say that those thing, those little chicken bites from BP, fucking delicious. <laughs> yeah. Have oh, you man, tried save the? It. Save it, Regan. What save it. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll get there. <laughs> those no, those the little, you know, the ones, the little southern, yeah. southern style chicken bites. Yeah. Have you yeah, tried yeah, yeah. the the little mac and cheese ones? They do as well. What? No. Oh, they man. do them. Yeah, it's mac and cheese in the in the crumb. Yeah, you're, you're, you're speaking stuff. my language, Balthazar. I was going to mention the mac and cheese <laughs> yeah, ones. Yeah, so good. Wait, mac and cheese. Mac and cheese bites. Yeah, from BP. Deep fried mac and cheese. I don't understand. Like, <laughs> is it a ball of mac and cheese? Yeah, but yeah, like battered, like crumbed mac and cheese. Oh man. <laughs> oh, it's like a cardiac arrest. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> pretty incredible. <laughs> Call myself up. Yeah, I just wanted you to miss another call. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> it's like on the other side of the room. I was like, what the? <laughs> How many uh, missed calls? My, I've got a zero for three now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Overcast Gamer Show. It is the 19th of April, and I'm joined, as per usual, by... Regan Harper. Balthazar Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> you probably Hopefully just... that doesn't come through too loud. We're having a few technical issues tonight. You're uh, going to... Involving... Oh, you clip so up. hard on that. <laughs> you need to just talk normally, all right? None of us... All right. Yeah, so I'm all looking right. forward to listening to what that sounded like. Good stuff. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting. Uh, how's everyone doing? How, how did you guys fare throughout the, uh, the storm? Uh, which storm was that? <laughs> I, I wasn't aware of any storms. I would say the same thing. I mean, it, it did it did hit parts of the country pretty bad. Uh, there was someone with a roof had, that that came off in in Fakatani up there. So some people did get quite battered. Uh, fortunately, I guess we were just lucky enough to to miss the brunt of it, kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Fair bit of flooding, well, well, quite a few slips, yeah. things like that. Where, where I was in Auckland, uh, I, I even went home about half an hour early because um, I heard there was going to be 160k gusts of wind, and I thought. Bugger it! I'm gonna turn into a you know a blimmin' flying squirrel or sugar glider if I end up on my <laughs> motorbike on the way home. Yeah. Um, yeah. If my if my you know jacket rides up a little bit, so I, I left work in one of the more pleasant rides I have to say. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Every, traffic everyone. On the road. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> yeah, leaving work early is the tits and. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's like yeah. a dream. It's awesome. such a small thing. It's like but a dream, no, yeah. it, it totally fizzled out for us. Like we're we're in Wellington, and um, I I think once it hit hit land, it kind of just fizzled out and wasn't really a thing so i mean it was by the time it hit us it was kind of just like a normal wellington night it was just a bit rainy and a bit windy so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that sounds about right yeah i think um yeah it hit, it hit uh bay of plenty and uh what is what was the other place uh, hawks bay quite bad i think and then mm. once it traveled in like, as you mentioned it just sort of yeah fizzled fizzled out a wee bit so that's all well and good. We had a we had a bit of fear mongering going on in the media about oh, it, big time, <laughs> <laughs> which which was was interesting. But uh, I haven't come to expect any less from those two news outlets. Mm. <laughs> uh, How much choice but, here in New Zealand? Well, yeah, Jesus. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so we're we're spoiled for choice in terms of um, shitty journalism, tabloid headlines, and uh, you know it's 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 pretty shocking. But hopefully. Uh, the storm, or what was left of it, meant you guys were able to get some gaming in. What have, what have you you been playing, Regan? Uh, I want to start with you, man, because you have yourself a new console, and I want to hear all about it. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, we I guess we haven't talked about this since it, it feels like old news, but we haven't talked yeah. about it since uh, yeah. since the last pod. Uh, bought myself a Nintendo Switch, which is very nice. Yeah, which is good. Um, I'm in love with the thing, eh? Like, if I'm talking mm. about the console itself, it's yeah, it's fucking great. Yeah. Um, Sort of echoing Balthazar's sentiments. Yeah, uh, that, essentially. Yeah. It, it's the kind of thing where you you kind of, you don't really quite get it before you have one. And yeah. you're like, it seems a little bit odd. And I, the whole docking thing, what's the deal there? But then you get it and it all just makes total sense. Mm. It, yeah. You know, yeah. You, you just pick it up and you walk out the room and you play it. And then you come back in, you sit down, you put it on the thing. There's no delay, like there's no kind of question as to how it's used. There's literally like, uh, aside from the game buttons themselves, there's like one other button and it's the on button or and the volume buttons as well. Mm. And that's it. Like 
you don't have to worry about like properly turning it off. You just press it and it goes to sleep and you're good. Um, Regan, I'm, I'm drawing startling parallels between what you're saying and, uh, you know, someone who's just had a child. You, you, you know, you don't really know it until you've had one. It doesn't <laughs> you don't really know what it feels like. I think that uh, might be it. kind of fell, fell apart when you started talking about pressing buttons and it goes to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty much analogous. Like, uh, yeah, I guess. It, and that's the thing, right? Like when parents say, oh, man, it's so rewarding. You're like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, it just yeah. sounds like a whole lot of work. like hell on earth. Yeah, but um, it's it's a fucking brilliant little console. Um, mm. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Um, things like, I mean, there were, I guess there were complaints about things and, and, and not all of the, the kind of configurations that it works are amazing, I would say. Like, you know, when you take out the little Joy-Cons from the side and they say that you can just hold them in your hands individually yeah. and, and play them? Yeah, yeah. That's a bit shite, like... You think you would think that that would might be comfortable, but then like you're, it's comfortable in the sense that you can lean back and kind of like lean on mm. your seat and and do whatever you like with your body. But then I found my hands have to kind of like do this weird sort of like arthritic crab claw grip <laughs> yeah. thing to keep them oh, in the your old, hands. The old arcade <laughs> machine claw. <laughs> yeah, exactly, oh, yeah. and um and that's that gets quite uncomfortable. Like for example, in Zelda, you've got to use you know one of the the, the left back triggers to sort of use your. Uh, what do you call it? The thing with the stick and the string, uh, bow and arrow, oh, yes. um, and <laughs> that's you know, yeah, that's quite difficult to do when you just have them. So, like, it's the kind of thing where there's lots of options, and I suppose you don't have to play it in any particular way. But like, some of them are kind of better than others. But um, yeah, I've just been playing Zelda, and Zelda is good. Zelda is is, it, is good, not great. Oh, it's very great. It's very good. Okay. It's, okay. It's, yeah, I just want to double check yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. No, Zelda's um, it, it's everything that people have been talking about. Essentially, it's it's a fantastic game. It's got space. It's got music. It's got awesome little gameplay loops that just carry on being awesome. Uh, shrines with puzzles that make you kind of scratch your head for a little while, and then when you get them, they're usually like really satisfying. Um, yeah that rewarding exploration oh man it's so good it's so good um way too much to talk about in a in a two minute segment where i tell you what i've been playing but um <laughs> yeah maybe we'll maybe balthazar and i'll sit down and have a proper chat about it and we'll pop mm. it up on the channel at some stage because there's just there's a lot to say there's a lot to say yeah 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 no absolutely well just in that similar vein Regan, uh i actually got to have a go on a mate switch for for a decent period of time over the weekend, uh, we're talking hours and hours and hours oh, on nice. end. Yep. Uh, I wasn't playing Zelda. I watched him play Zelda for a little bit, and that was that was awesome. It looked beautiful, and I can't wait to play it. But what I've been playing is Snipper Clips. Mm. Uh, now, this is the weird little game that Nintendo released alongside the launch of the Switch. I think it might have had a demo available in the eShop for free or something like that. Is that correct, Balthazar? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was free. It still is now. You can play, I think, four, four or five levels for free. Oh, yeah. awesome! Yeah, def- definitely worth it. Yeah, so this is a this is another odd little Nintendo <laughs> project, as per usual. Uh, you sort of, um, you know, it's best with multiple people. You can play by yourself and sort of uh, and change between characters, but it's best with 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 a friend or you know partner or whatever. Um, so you sort of each take the the form of of a shape, and you have to complete certain tasks with with your with your shape. And the sort of mechanics revolve around you being able to cut pieces off your comrade. Um, in terms of you can sort of hover over them and the shapes will overlap and it'll show you which which parts you can cut off mm-hmm. and you can cut them into into shapes to hook levers or you know dribble a basketball and, and bounce it into a into a hoop kind of thing or even just form a shape it might give you the shape of a fish and say hey both of you get into the shape of the fish and sort of hang around each other and jump around and, and cut bits off until you can both sort of vaguely resemble the shape of a fish we didn't do the greatest job and it did kind of look like a, a three-year-old's painting at a kindergarten kind of thing um but man that game's a lot of fun it's it's really awesome because you get the people who are really meticulous and know exactly what they're doing like okay go here and you know you work really well with them i played with a, a couple of different friends it was interesting seeing their different mentalities mm. uh, another friend was complete described best, best described as complete anarchy <laughs> and I rolled with that as well. Uh, we were just all jumping and snipping all the time, and eventually we just got it done, uh, which was very fun. So, yeah, no, love, loving it. Eh? We we finished 
the the campaign mode, I guess if you want to call it that. Uh, it's just a bunch of bunch of puzzle levels kind of thing, but we finished that and um, had an absolute blast. I think it probably took us oh, a couple of hours, two or three hours maybe. Uh, but yeah, highly recommend Snipperclips. I'm not sure how much it is to buy. It was already installed on the console, but um, I would imagine it would it's, be no uh, more than thirty nine. It's, it's, it's saying on the Nintendo site nineteen ninety nine, but I would oh, hazard right. a guess and say that that is probably American. Mm. Yes, dollars? yes. So we'd say about twenty. Seven or twenty-five or something like, like that. Twenty-eight, probably twenty. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Which, yeah, seems seems reasonable. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'd I'd highly recommend Snuff Clips. It's a it's a you know boatload of fun. Mm, to be honest. Cool. Awesome. Um, I'll just whiz through a couple of other things because I've been playing a ton of stuff since we last did a podcast, but I can't talk about it all because it will be here all day. So uh, I'll talk about Oxen Free which is a indie sort of, um, I guess it's a platformer, exploration platformer type thing, but it's mainly driven by dialogue. Uh, the cool thing about Oxenfree is, you know, you're exploring this island with a whole bunch of people and, and uh, you're chatting to them and, and so to uncover more about their characters and more about the mystery that's unfolding. The, the really, what Oxenfree does really well is naturalizing conversations. So you can... When people are talking to you, you have about three options that pop up and on the screen in front of you, and you can click them and sort of interrupt people if you want. If you click them right away, you'll interrupt someone, or it might just flow on naturally from what they said, but they've done it really well. It's not like really stilted, small, written vignettes of conversations. It's It, it really feels like a naturalistic conversation you're having with sometimes two to three people at a time, um, and it's incredible. I watched a, a wee documentary that came with the game which all games should do. They should include a documentary because I love them. Um, <laughs> and all the all these pieces of dialogue were recorded separately. They, none of these people were together when they were recording them. They have these massive dialogue trees that just go off on all these options that, that can happen. And I just, it's it's a wonder. It's a wonder of a game. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. It's really interesting. So you might have two or three different options that you can say, and that will spark a massive tree off to like three or four different options and, yeah, 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 it's it's pretty cool because it's sort of a coming of age story. So everyone's a, a, a bit of an angsty teenager, sure. uh, but, but there's an X Files esque uh, mystery wrapped up uh, around that sort of thing, and that that's the main drive of the story. But yeah, the the the, the main mechanic is um, is these conversations, which which are pretty pretty well done, to be honest. Like I'm a big big um, you know stickler for writing. Uh, mm. I find if if it's bad writing, the whole thing collapses like a house of cards. But the writing in this is is fantastic so i'd highly recommend oxen free i got it for 10 bucks on sale uh on the playstation store and that is an absolute steal <laughs> abe's all about his deals so oh, there I, you go. I am i you know i'll, I'll, I'll pimp a, a place called psprices.com uh which you know the, the playstation interface i find really crappy the store interface where it, it does you know it doesn't really get the deals that i want i can't personalize it so i mm. actually see stuff that i want to buy yeah um ps prices has a sort of wish list feature so you can go in and add a whole bunch of crap to your wish list and um i get an email every time there's a decent decent uh decent discount on something so i find that really really handy and these devs are getting uh they should probably get a kickback ps prices to be honest because i've bought a crap ton of games uh that i wouldn't have known about <laughs> if they hadn't emailed me or let me know about it so yeah definitely recommend oxen free um, I'll touch on Watch Dogs 2, uh, which is Regan's copy of Watch Dogs 2, which he kindly sent up to me a while ago. Uh, and then it, kind of, it it sort of just got put to one side while <laughs> what was it, Horizon, while. Yeah. Horizon Zero Dawn. And you, you know what, Abe? That's totally fine, mate. You, yeah, you yeah know, it, it, it is. Yeah, I'm not going to hold that against you. No, just, what, yeah. Watch Dogs 2 is um, it's a really fun game. I, I was a bit hes- hesitant about it. I put in probably an hour before Horizon came out, and then I you know, put it to one side, and I was like, oh, it seems all right. It's really fun. Um, it's exactly what Watch Dogs 1 should have been, which is you know, sort of the echo chamber on the internet with the reviews of this game. And I did miss the boat on this game. You know, it came out, what, last year sometime, late last year. Uh, but it's really good. It has really sort of interesting characters. It has It doesn't take itself too seriously, which is the main thing which Watch Dogs 1 did and pretty much ruined that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, the characters are all just kind of weird little um, ha- millennial hackers, uh, and that would be incredibly obnoxious and, and hard to hard to bear. But the fact that it just has that wink and nudge uh, thing going on, it, it actually makes the game a lot of fun. And, you know, I've driven a car, a self-driving car around like Knight Rider, and uh, that's exactly what I wanted from this sort of game. So mm. enjoying Watch Dogs 2 a lot, and uh, I'll continue to play that uh the last thing i want to talk about is 
the my most anticipated game of the year, which has released and I've put in about fifteen hours into it, which is ukulele. I've been waiting and, for this, Abe. I've been yeah. excited to hear the result of this. Uh, I, it... I I haven't seen a more divisive divisively reviewed game in a long time. Um, oh, ukulele! It's uh, from some people on the internet got two out of ten. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, it, this was Jim Sterling from the UK, yeah. and which is remarkable because I mean, it, I, I think its open critic score is like you know, in the mid seventies somewhere. Yeah, uh, two out of ten feels like surely there's something you can give it credit for. That, yeah, it's, it's an two out of one. ten. He was smoking crack, Regan. To be honest, uh, <laughs> yeah. two, two allegedly two out of ten um, is, is ludicrous. Well, tell tell I, me I'm your doing... thoughts. Yeah, I, I'm really enjoying ukulele. Um, the first the first level is by far the strongest, I feel, and that kind of puts you, and it gives you a little bit of false hope because the game does go a wee bit downhill after that first world. Uh, the first world is, is really refined, lovely looking, lush kind of jungle environment. A lot of funny characters, a lot of collectibles, which is exactly what I was looking for. This game, no, make no mistake, is very archaic in its mechanics and its you know design and everything like that. It's essentially just Banjo-Kazooie reskinned. Uh, it has a sort of hub world that's very linear. So you can't you can't jump around from world to world sort of thing. You have to actually follow a path and go back to the other world. And that does get a bit tiresome. But hey. It's Banjo Kazooie. That's what you did in Banjo Kazooie. I'm not mm. complaining about that. Um, I I would have liked it to be an, a sort of evolution or homage to to that sort of uh, the rare platformer as opposed mm. to a direct carbon copy, I guess which is what it is. Yeah, I mean that's the that's the thing, right? Like, is there a place for just a carbon copy these days? Like, uh, there might be a few people like yourself out there who really love the nostalgia of it, but what's the yeah. point? Like, if you're not going to sort of push the boundaries at least a little bit, like you're just kind of if you, you want to play Banjo Kazooie, go play Banjo Kazooie. Yeah, yeah, it's already yeah. There. It, it does seem a little bit redundant in that. I just think the 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 guys at Rare or Playtonic who made this game, you know, a whole bunch of ex Rare members got a bit sick of all the the grey blue shooters and all that sort of things that are classified as gaming nowadays, and and just really wanted to go back to the to the basics. And mm. I think that was a little bit to to their detriment. Uh, they they probably pushed it back a wee bit too much. Uh, but that being said, I'm still having a blast with this game. There's a lot to love. It's it's got that you know tongue in cheek British humour, mm. absurd British humour there in spades. Uh, there's things like a you know a boss battle who is literally just a ramp. He's just a piece of concrete uh, called, <laughs> called Rampo, and, and uh, he he mistakes you for a um, a window a double glazing salesman, and and that's why the boss battle kicks off essentially. Wow. Through some misunderstandings. I'm sure there's some kind of context to that, but uh, you'd be surprised how little context there is. So we um, are we going to get a full review from you, Abe? Yeah, I think I will knock out a full review for this. Um, I'm not sure when because I'm I think I'm still only about halfway through the game at, at mm. 15 hours from what I've heard of it. So it's average of around 30 hours. Uh, but it's a really it's a really it's, you know it's one of my games that I love just to be able to zen out to just just put it on and just run around and collect stuff and have a good time. Uh, I will mention that the voice acting, which again follows Banjo Kazooie, the you know rah, 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 where they just speak gibberish <laughs> and, and sort of enunciate every syllable, uh, it is very grating and it has not aged well. <laughs> Sounds like some of the people that I talk to on the phone every day, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah essentially, yeah. <laughs> that that sort of grunting and groaning on a is is brutal. To be honest, it's it's really bad, and they. I don't know how that got through QA without people being like, hey, I'm going to get, I got tired of this in five seconds. How are people going to feel playing 30 hours of this? Like that, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty annoying. Mm. Uh, but there, yeah, there is a lot to love in this game. It looks beautiful. It's jolly, which we don't see much nowadays. It's got really cool mechanics. Uh, I just wish it was, yeah, it, it, you know, it was a bit more modernized as opposed to being a, a complete, carbon copy of a of a, of a banjo kazooie or or what have you sort of thing so a uh, little bit disappointing but i you know I'm, I'm still having a blast with it so i can't argue uh, too much about that balthazar what have you been playing man um so i won't you know go over things that have already been in you know 
talked about. Uh, Hannah and I have been playing through Snipper Clips as well. Agree with your nice. sentiments there. I, um, we definitely, well, I lean towards the anarchy route. Um, you'd be surprised how many <laughs> levels you complete. You Why can am I not complete surprised, yeah, actually by just immediately, <laughs> as soon as the level starts, run towards the goal, rotating clockwise in your starting <laughs> shape. You can pass so many levels just doing that. It's, really? Yeah, yeah. Just keep spinning clockwise, and eventually <laughs> things will happen. Um, <laughs> Uh, other than that, I've uh, been playing uh, the big one I'll talk about, and it's a big one in terms of interest rather than anything. Is a f- one of the free what month are we in? April. One of the free April PS Plus games, uh, Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time. Um, this is a very interesting game. Uh, again, a co-op one. Hannah and I have been playing through it, and this game is essentially a it's really hard to describe it's like an arcadey sort of space shooter where you control separate characters inside a spaceship and you have to kind of run to the different stations within the spaceship to do things so one of the stations is like the piloting station and so whoever's sitting in there flies the ship around Uh, there's four gunner stations controlling the four guns facing at different angles around the ship there's the shield station there's the yamato station and so you kind of have to playing two player you know you have to kind of distribute your resources so you're each sitting in the most valuable stations at any given time to to operate the tools uh, right. And you have to essentially just fly through levels, de- defeating enemies, rescuing space rabbits, and <laughs> as you do, it's all very it's, yeah, strange. Like the game in general is just like trippy as fuck. Like it's just it's just acid trip. The game um, <laughs> sounds great, but yeah, no, it's it's a really fun little game. And the reason it's kind of a big one to mention is purely because it's the first time in a long time I've had a lot of fun with a free PS Plus game. Yeah, um, yeah, so, I, I would echo that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Uh, really interesting one to check out. Um, other than that, uh, I guess kind of the big one is in the AAA I've been playing is the Ring City DLC for Dark Souls 3 came out since our last pod. So the final DLC um, for Dark Souls. And just fun. Just fun, really. You want to hear about that? Go back and listen to our podcasts. You know, back when I talked about Dark Souls 3 when that came out, <laughs> nothing's changed. It's still just a lot of fun to just play the PvP, invade worlds, or um, summon a friend into your world and just, you know, fight people, kill them, get better shit, kill them easier. The old, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's kind of the loop, really, isn't yeah. it? Uh, yeah. And yeah. no, that's it. Like, it's been, that's been the big thing for me. I mean, over the long Easter weekend, I put in 40 hours of pvp in dark souls 3 so that's really been the big thing for me um and then i will next i won't talk about it too much this pod i'll make it my thing i'll talk about next podcast i've only played a couple of hours of psychopaths mandatory happiness because we brought it up in one of our streams i think the andromeda one as it was sitting on my shelf and it was a game i'd never touched so i put it in and decided to try it out and so far it's been somewhat enjoyable it's hard to call it a game like, we'll get that out of the way straight away. <laughs> it's essentially, like, the selling point for this experience is, do you like Psycho Pass? Cool, it's new, and it's in the Psycho Pass. Like, it's a new story in the Psycho Pass universe, so if you like Psycho Pass, you know, you'll, you'll enjoy it. But if you like games, you probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think the genre, they, it, you know, it, it fits into the visual novel genre where it's essentially a, a comic book that plays out. Or no, comic book's kind of misleading because it's not panels or pages or anything. But, you know, it's just, it's just scenes, basically, um, happening in front of you. And your interaction is choices. So you decide which characters go where, what you say in conversations. And something quite cool in this game is just that because you're a detective trying to solve crimes, the outcome, you know, is based on every... It's one of those stupid things every decision you make matters but because literally the whole gameplay loop is just making choices yes that is correct because all they've done is told a story (laughs) they have made you know a different ending for every possible combination of choices you make in each case kind of thing um so it is fun just having to pay attention to all the details like in the first case you've only got time to get to one floor to try and get to the uh the criminal and the hostage he has before he kills the hostage 
Um, so with the time you have, there's like five floors and you can only go and check one of them. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of think back to, okay, the last scene in which we saw the villain talking to the hostage, what was the background, you know, what was around him? And then you kind of look at the floor plan and go, okay, which floor would this scene have been at kind yeah. of thing? And so it really does just encourage, like you have to pay attention to everything. So it's not a game, but it, it, it is highly interactive. Like you do need to fully pay attention to everything that's going on. Um, Darth is a, now j yeah. just for people who don't know what Psycho Pass is, it's, a, it's an anime, right? It is, yeah. So it's an anime set in the future where crime has attempted to be eradicated by essentially successfully finding a way to monitor people's psychological state. Uh, and so there are these monitoring stations all over the place and people are, you know, basically permanently kept tabs on. And so if your state elevates to, you know, being in a position where people feel you could commit a crime, the police will show up at your address and take you in for, you know, health care or what have you until your, your, <laughs> your psycho pass is back within a reasonable range and then they'll, you know, let you back out into the public again. And if you're too far gone and you're considered a, a genuine threat, then... The Dominator will decide what happens to you, which is the name of the these Dominator. guns that are locked unless you point them at a latent criminal. And if they're considered someone who can be rehabilitated, it will stun them. If they're considered beyond redempt redemption, it will just blow them up. They just what explode and melt. What a ridiculous idea. That's um, great. So, yeah, I had to stop playing that after a couple of hours because the second case got really heavy really quick. And it was about the abuse and murder of a two-year-old child who was beaten oh, to death man. and they got <laughs> wow. really graphic with the description and i was like eh. <laughs> yeah, i got a to much. a point where basically i've almost solved it i just can't make the final decision i know that i have to when i go back to playing it but i've solved it and everything's you know kind of worked out except not because now because of the trauma the baby's gone through he has an elevated psychopath and the dominator has detected him as a target to be eliminated so my choice is kill a six-month-old baby <laughs> or allow him to live knowing that because of his psychopath he's basically been condemned to a lifetime in prison with no chance of rehabilitation so That's he'll never be let interesting out interesting moral quandary i yeah. think i would allow him to live because... i had to stop because i was like this shit's too heavy i thought i was going to get a happy <laughs> ending because i solved the murder of a two-year-old now it turns out all i did was just vaguely prevent the murder of a six-month-old but now maybe i have to kill him anyway like what well, this game is heavy it gets heavy quick um but way yeah. to bring the escape I'm psychopath. Yeah, more on that in the future when I've actually gotten a chance to play more than two hours. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what how that moral quandary sort of yeah. unravels itself. Mm. <laughs> what um what console are you playing then on? Uh, so that's on PS4. I got that as that's a PS4. as a PS4 game. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Is that is that it for you? Yeah, there was an Overwatch event, but you know, there's always stuff in Overwatch. Always playing that. <laughs> this one's PVE, with, which is exciting because it shows that they listen when we say we want PVE content. But, you know, very, we've talked very about cool. So Overwatch, that's a fully-fledged so. sort of campaign thing that's coming? Yeah, yeah it's, like, it's just one mission. Um, it's like a maybe eight minutes or so uh, mission to go through. Um, just fighting robots and bigger robots and other robots. biggest robots. <laughs> robots with um, legs and robots yeah, with it's, it's Yeah, so it's interesting that they've done it because it does show that, you know, there is the potential. I mean, people have really enjoyed it. So hopefully they'll be like, oh, well, maybe we should just release a full-fledged campaign, which everyone and has been asking for since day one. So Is that completely free as well? It is, yeah. So it's just one of their random seasonal update kind of things. So, yeah, just uh, just the latest patch introduced this selectable mission. Very nice, very yeah, nice. That That's awesome, cool. man. Mm. All right, well, we'll move into, uh, we'll almost get to the news. Before we get to the news, I wanted to try out a new segment just to see this is a big experiment to see if this actually works. <laughs> uh, we won't see the payoff until next week, but we'll give it a whirl anyway. Uh, Regan, I want to start with you, man. So if you want to, do you have our uh, our doc open in front of you there? I do, yeah. Got a, got a URL for you. <laughs> mm, mm. Uh, if you want to open up that URL... And let me know when you've got that open and, I've, uh, and I've got I'll, it I'll here. give a brief, yeah, yeah. brief synopsis. So what we're going to do, the segment's called Pitch Me a Dream. And we have a video game name generator uh, that you can find at videogamena.me. Um, what Regan's going to do is he's going to randomly generate a video game name. Next week, we're going to give him a, a t or fortnight, fortnight, sorry, next fortnight, Regan's going to pitch us 
a uh, a game that he you know from this title that, that he generates here uh, he can decide what system it's on just judging by the name or just whatever he likes uh, but he'll have to give us a brief pitch and try and sell us on this game brilliant we'll, we'll be acting as uh, you know as the the publishers ea or ubisoft or whoever you <laughs> to so you guys get would. to decide whether or not you actually give me money to make this game yeah we do yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. and I, I think we'll, we'll we'll take all you know business business decisions into consideration here <laughs> should uh, we be different so Regan, do you want to go ahead and generate yourself a name there man should we be different uh different publishers abe and kind of act as that publisher would Ooh, potentially like with their decision yeah this so i'll say it now i'm bandai namco okay <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 nice you, can be, you can be bandai namco you go for it what are you going to be abe um man i mean i i throw I throw shade on them so often that I think I might just have to step into their shoes. Uh, I might be Ubisoft. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. I'm going to hit the generate button here now. Go for um, it, man. <clears throat> oh, man. Okay. <laughs> My game name is Heavy Metal STD Polo. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's, that's going to be metal. interesting. STD Polo. So yeah, if Some... you want to come up with the uh, you know the, the basic premise, the genre, all that sort of stuff, Regan, what are, what are your initial thoughts my... on this? Uh, on this... <laughs> my initial thoughts is that maybe like heavy metal, I think obviously the, the genre of music. So you know maybe yeah. it could be some kind of music based thing, um, or like a perhaps like a I'm thinking maybe like a manga esque type art style where they're all like members of a heavy metal hair band or something okay um so uh... <laughs> maybe like maybe like do you guys know brutal legend that um yeah will find game mm. Mm. it had a sort of heavy metal art style with jack black as a as a rocker maybe like that but multiplayer sports version of oh something like that. yeah oh, yeah like a po- sure. <laughs> polo game <laughs> with metal. i'm not yeah. sure if there even is a polo game but i guess we'll uh, we'll find out yeah so yeah. Regan, just want to reiterate that title I've, I've all right so yep to reiterate name. and if someone wants to record this for posterity um Absolutely. well i mean we're, we're recording the podcast so that's fine <laughs> um the name of the game is heavy metal std polo so std yeah. in capital letters actually uh, transmitted disease yeah oh. <laughs> um so yeah i'll get my thinking cap on and we'll um and i guess on the next pod we'll we'll pitch my game yeah yeah regan will be pitching that game to ubisoft and bandai namco to see who <laughs> wants to bandai i'm counting on you i'm counting on you <laughs> heavy metal std polo okay no that's great that's um i'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with there man <laughs> uh in the news we have so many things to talk about in the news uh we're going to be here for years if we do i think we'll just talk about the big one and if we have time maybe another one xbox scorpio has been announced the specs have been revealed uh six teraflops as we as we all you know as we've been told about, <laughs> yeah. no one really understands what that means but uh there you go so i'll just run off these specs really quickly um so we've got for the cpu we've got eight core 2.3 gigahertz processor GPU, we've got four, com- I don't know what, compute, that looks like this is translated into another language, compute with an E, units at the 1172 megahertz, uh, we've got 12 <laughs> gigs of, I'm not sure this page is keep going, translated, keep going, keep yeah, going. Yeah. Uh, we've got 12 gigs of GDDR5, uh, shared between the OS and the GPU, bandwidth, which I honestly can't tell you what what just bandwidth means um in terms of you know a system 326 gigabytes of bandwidth regan do you have any idea about this you know what that means just bash straight up bandwidth it's the width of the band yeah like how wide the band is yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> i mean uh, i i think to to answer your question and and i could be totally off on this you know yeah. Yeah, the bandwidth in my knowledge of computing is is kind of the speed at which all the various components of that system can speak to one another so right, right. you might have a you know a however many gigahertz cpu or gpu or whatever if the bandwidth um, of those channels between that piece of hardware and let's say your ram is not high enough to kind of control all the information then you know you're not going to get the full kind of grunt from you know whatever gigahertz you've got so 
Right. That's what I think it is, if that, that makes sounds any sense. Pretty, that sounds pretty uh, reasonable there. I if I'm wrong, I'd... I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, let yeah, let us in, let us know. Uh, Overcastgamer at gmail dot com. Uh, you know, let us know how wrong we are about all this stuff. Uh, Three hundred twenty six gigabytes seems like a lot in terms of bandwidth. I don't know. I have zero frame of reference for that, but it seems like a lot. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> uh, storage we've got one terabyte uh, hard drive. That's one uh, we can all understand. One yeah, we, we at good. least we know what that one means. Um, and the disc drive is a ultra high def Blu-ray player, so 4K Blu-ray player, uh, which is cool because that was something that everyone whinged about the PS Pro not having. So no one can whinge about the Scorpio not having one. Mm. Uh, so we've just culled a bunch of whinging there, which is always good. Uh, what are you guys? Were you guys whelmed, underwhelmed, overwhelmed in terms of these specs? Uh, I, I it's it sits about where I thought it would sit. Um, yeah, you're comfortably yeah. whelmed, Regan. Yeah, I'm. I'm probably a, a sort of a six out of ten on the whelm scale. Okay. Um, basically, because with consoles, you know, there's always that thing to say that PCs are always just going to smash you out of the water. But that's because you can spend, uh, you know, as much money on a PC as you want to. Consoles are always walking that line of of cost versus performance. Um, you know, and, and so I think at the price point, what they've got there sounds great i think the theory like we were tossing about an idea that maybe it might be like eight hundred dollars ish or maybe perhaps it sounds it sounds about right to me 800 yeah maybe maybe slightly more i don't know depending on how more or less yeah but i think given given that they're aiming at a console market i think it'd be really cool it'll be interesting to hear a bit about like how it's going to perform as far as sort of i guess developers wanting to develop on the architecture i suppose it'd be very similar to everything else like just writing code for the xbox itself um yeah i am i imagine it's just almost like one iota away from being a pc at this point sort yeah because it's more or less, microsoft yeah, yeah. All that, that that knowledge and that tech so it must just be a sort of mid-tier low low to mid-tier pc kind of thing mm. what are your thoughts on it both Indifferent. Yes, indifferent. There we have it. <laughs> I, I've always made my, you know, stance clear. Even like PC gaming aside, 0.5 console generations are just pointless. Well, like, well here's a, here's a question, follow-up question then. Do you think this is a 0.5 for the Xbox, or do you think this is their next thing? I think it's a 0.5 because yeah. they've not indicated that it's anything more than that it, so i mean if it turns out to be more awesome i'm all for the scorpio it sounds like a great little package as you've already said like in terms of value for for what it would appear to be capable of based on our vague understandings of all the numbers <laughs> they've thrown at us um yeah it sounds pretty awesome so if that is their next system because i mean that was going to be my argument essentially it's it's my argument against the ps4 pro not that it needs any help but there's no exclusives for the PS4 Pro. Without an exclusive, there's nothing truly taking advantage of it because they can release patches for you know PS4 games to make them pro-ready or whatever as much as they like. But the fact is, the game is coded for the lowest common denominator, which is the PS4. So from the ground up, it's built for a less powerful system. It will never truly push the potential of the more powerful system. So if the Scorpio is just a 0.5 console, it's irrelevant how powerful they make it because games will still be made for the Xbox One. Like, they will still, from the ground up, be built for the less powerful system. So the more powerful one will never truly get to see what it's capable of. So if they don't right. make Scorpio exclusives, I'm yeah, that's why I'm completely indifferent. Because I don't believe they will make Scorpio exclusives. So essentially, I have no concern whatsoever with what they do with it. It's just a thing. It's just, yeah, it's just a thing that's come out. It's just that's a thing seen. that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, nice. It sounds similar to, uh, you know, when on the last t batch of, of PS3 and Xbox 360 games to come out, Destiny and and things like Far Cry 4, which were made for PS3 and, and 360, but also made for PS4 and um, mm. Xbox One. And, you know, they were hampered by that. They were yeah. th Those versions, the PS4 and the Xbox One versions, were much less of what they could have been had they only been made for that system. Mm, yeah. Uh, so it sounds like that similar thing that that's what you're going at kind of thing yeah that's exactly it yeah yeah so I, I you know i think it's it's pretty cool um 
again, it's all about the games. It's always all about the games, and there's nothing being released. We'll, we'll, we'll have to wait till E3. They need new IP. Microsoft really need new IP. Mm, they need um, something to come along, eh? I, I'm, yeah, they I'm, do. I'm gunning for them, the C3. Absolutely. I, th- I, th- I think if they can come out with the Scorpio and something fucking sweet as far as a new game goes, they could do really well. Um, and I'd imagine that that's totally their plan, right? Like they, yeah. That's that's the obvious thing to do. Hello, Wombats Evolved. <laughs> wombats Evolved. Hello, Wombat Evolved. <laughs> yeah, that's what it'll be. Nice. There's, yeah, I, I yeah. would hope that Phil Spencer has a couple of things up his sleeve, and I think he does, just just judging by him, uh, you know, as a, as a businessman. Um, it seems like he's pretty smart in the way that he sort of resurrected the Xbox brand from the abysmal Xbox One launch. Um, he's actually made it, you know, a... a given them a fighting chance again mm-hmm. uh, from all the stuff he's done so far, including Xbox Game, Game Pass and everything like that. So, you know, you, can you guys think of anything that you would, that would not win you over, but that would put them in, in a good light in terms of IP that they could announce or, or anything they could announce really at this, this E3? Kingdom Under Fire 2 development has been resumed and it's an exclusive for the Scorpio. Ooh. <laughs> Kingdom Under Fire, that was... Uh, that was the weird not... RTS action RPG hybrid game. Oh, uh, is that that's your fa- right. Yeah, is that yeah. your, one of your favorite games? Yeah, time? it's up oh, there. I love that game. Um, I love yep. that series, technically, because it was originally an RTS series on PC, and then when it moved to the original Xbox with uh, Crusaders and uh, there was another one, Heroes, um, yeah, that was when it became kind of the hybrid that also had the third-person action RPG stuff. And it was just, it was really interesting, really unique, really cool. And then all the screenshots and videos and everything for number two being made looked amazing. And then it just disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, so since my first experience with it was on the original Xbox, if they decide that Microsoft is going to resurrect it and they're going to pay for two and it's going to be exclusive, yeah, that would potentially sell me on a Scorpio. Nice, nice. Regan, anything there for you, man? Uh, I can't think of a, a, like a particular example, but um, I think they they should rethink something with their in-house stuff, right? Like um, just just something cool and new. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I want, but I'm willing <laughs> to let Microsoft decide what I want for me. If it's yeah, <laughs> if it's if it's something great, I'm all for it. Lay it on. So not not Gears of War five or Halo six. No, no. If it's either of those, I'm out. <laughs> you're out you're out <laughs> throw your hands up you're out yeah um, they need they need to rethink it and it can't i don't think it can be a shooter like i think it needs to be something no. new or yeah. a racing no, game yeah or a yeah. racing game yeah um, or a racing game <laughs> the, the least new genre <laughs> 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 the genre that's been around since the original nintendo uh or atari even um the only thing i can think of that would really win me over is rare uh, developing a brand new Conkers game, oh, yeah. uh, like a like a decent Conkers game, not Conker Live and Reloaded, which was this horrible affront to the original. Uh, they took out a bunch of references that weren't deemed acceptable anymore, mm. um, which is something like bullshit. Conker Conker got a haircut or something like that. You know, something something fresh. <laughs> I see what you did there, Regan. Yeah, it's, it, it took it took me a while, but I see I see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Definitely something with with that sort of charm, and you know, a lot of the rare guys have have moved into Platonic now. But I'm sure there's still something. There's still some of them left, and they can they can crank out a, an awesome new 3D. So just some sort of cool 3D platformer for me is all I need. <laughs> you know, they had I could, have, I could have guessed. <laughs> they, yeah, yeah, right. They had Recore and. Balthazar nailed the the score on that. What was it like sixty four or something? Remember you got like ten yeah. points in the quiz we did. Yeah, <laughs> with a complete um, guess. And recall, <laughs> yeah, it was not the system seller. Or you know, I ask ask people, even people into gaming, about recall, and they'll probably go, "What?" To be honest, like no one really knows what that game is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's 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 a few things they could do. Not none of which are, are jumping to mind, but um, just just leaps and bounds in tech and things like that. So. Go on, Phil Spencer. Do something that wows us. Mm. And, I'm ready uh, we'll for it, a... Phil. I'm ready. Yeah, they, they had a good E3 last year, right? Xbox, they had a pretty good E3 last year. They did, yeah. Um, mm, yeah with the old game Xbox anyway. Slim and all that sort of stuff. And then, them, you know, it leaking and them just starting the conference with it being up on a big uh, a big screen and barely talking about it and then moving on. I was like, oh, that's a really classy move there, Microsoft. I like mm. it. 
they did handle it well. Yeah. Let's let's see what happens. My my body yeah. is ready, Phil. My body is ready. <laughs> body is ready. Wrong uh wrong business head there, Regan, but I, I appreciate the message. <laughs> um well we'll we'll breeze through a few more news topics just really quickly. Peter Molyneux of Fable fame and bullshittery fame uh, is back uh, after his his studio. I think it was called Two Cans or Ten Cans, some some amount of cans got canned, <laughs> and uh, they they closed down. Peter Molyneux <laughs> back uh, doing what he does best, which is talking about how innovative and amazing his thing is going to be. You can't pin it pin it into a box. You can't define what genre it is. Mm. Uh, but he says it's pretty cool. Um, you know, even though he's refusing to f- share any details about it <laughs> at the moment. So he's just kind uh, of like walked out of a room and gone, "Hey guys, <laughs> hey guys, there's a really cool thing in that room." Yeah. Uh, but but don't look. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. Yeah. Well, last time we see said that, we got the we got the curiosity cube, um, which I'm not sure if you guys know about that, but it was a it was a sort of project he was working on. It was a mobile thing, and it was just this cube that had a load of made up of a bunch of different cubes, and you you just tapped on it. Everyone in the world who who had the app installed could just tap on it, and it slowly chipped away at this cube. The person who chipped away the last part was supposedly going to get some sweet prize, um, and the prize ended up being pretty much nothing really um <laughs> it, was a, it generates it, a new galaxy that you can explore oh god <laughs> peter molyneux teams up with sean murray there's just there's just so much you could cut that bullshit with a knife mate yeah, brutal but yeah i don't know peter molyneux is pretty unreliable um in the past i remember his original his original thing what he's most famous for was in fable he said that you'd be able to plant an acorn play the game through and, you know, grow up and all that and uh, come back and the acorn would be a tree. And that never happened. It was never included. <laughs> there was nothing like that included. In fact, the series went downhill pretty fast after the first fable. Mm. Um, so <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's pretty much a, a bullshit artist, really. Uh, but, you know, interesting character, very charismatic dude, very passionate guy, and you can't fault him for that. So mm. we'll keep I'm I'm sort of looking forward to it. I played black and white back in the day and thought it was fun. Yeah, I'll um, black and, yeah. So yeah, I mean it might not be awful. We'll no, see. no. He he did say that um, you know after he finished saying that you can't compartmentalize it to find what genre it is. He did say that he is thinking that mobile gaming is the way to go. So you know that doesn't stir uh, much hope for me. <laughs> um, remarks like that but yeah i guess we'll see uh one item that balthazar you mentioned a couple of weeks back was we happy few the game i don't know if it was an xbox exclusive but it was definitely marketed around the xbox sort of bioshock looking game is being turned into a movie uh it's mm. not even out of early access no it's not so yeah <laughs> good luck with that no no <laughs> you'll release a movie based on a horribly mismarketed game that people have already forgotten exists and haven't even been able to play. Like, I don't know who <laughs> yeah. the intended audience, like who are they marketing this towards? Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's weird. It's just the next in a long line of evidence piling up that people should just not make video game movies, which is sad, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd mm. probably agree mostly with that. I, I can't think of many. The last one we talked about was of course, Assassin's Creed. And uh, we all know how Regan feels about that movie. Yeah. Um, but we, I don't know, We Happy Few, it, it was a bit of a swing and a miss for me. It, it looked really cool. I remember them showing that at E3 and it looked really Bioshocky and kind of this weird mm. dystopian civilization where they keep everyone's emotions under wrap and, and no one's allowed to, you know, exert any sort of feeling. And then it was revealed to be some sort of weird survival game, yeah. uh, you know, like all other early access bloody Steam games are. And then no one really talked about it again. So... I don't really know what happened to it. And for some reason, Hollywood has decided that is worth investing in. <laughs> well, maybe so, it'll give them enough money to actually finish the game. Yeah, well, that's true. It could be a silver lining. That would be a bizarre turn of events, wouldn't it? A game it would. not even finished based off the early access title. <laughs> yeah. Based off the game that you can play right now. Kind of. <laughs> kind of, a, yeah. A little Half, bit. Yeah. One quarter. Um, <laughs> yeah, strange. Uh, again... Just a poor decision, in my opinion. Where's that Uncharted movie? 
that was supposedly in the works for a while. And I remember Mark Wahlberg was supposed to be Nathan Drake. <laughs> really? Marky yeah. Mark. Interesting. You guys remember that? The Uncharted movie was being tossed around for a while. Hmm. Like movies are slow to come about though, aren't they? So yeah. they could yeah. have like, who knows? They could have like filmed this thing like two years ago and they're still actually just kind of getting through post. So yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, actually. I don't know. We might, we might sure. see the, the most unnecessary, mo- uh, you know, movie adaptation of a game ever, which, cause, because the game is essentially a movie anyway. It yeah. It, really yeah matter. You're spot on. It's kind of like, yeah. Well, It'd be a money grab, I think, in a, in a lot of ways. And I don't think like people who really enjoy Uncharted would necessarily like be stoked to mm. see that their game has become a like, just an Indiana Jones knockoff, you know? Yeah, 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 it would be. It'd be a poor man's Indiana Jones kind of thing. So, yeah, not not too happy with that. But uh, I haven't seen anything about it for a while, so maybe it just got shit canned. Or oh, we can all we can all hope it it, it has. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is CD Projekt Red uh, have trademarked Cyberpunk uh, non maliciously. They they clarified because everyone got really up in arms uh, when they when they posted this tweet that they trademark Cyberpunk. You were like, you can't trade, trademark that. It was similar to when the I think it's the Fine Brothers on YouTube trademarked tried to trademark React. Oh right, um, yeah yeah. And, you know, react to, to to various things, and uh, people collectively lost their shit, and um, they they immediately had to retcon that and say, oh no no, we're not doing that sort of thing. So I assume, people, I assume that um they. Like the concern there is because cyberpunk is sort of like a genre of yeah of book. It, it's a pretty common descriptor for for mm. various you know uh, universes that that um, artists come up with kind of thing. Mm. I'm okay with it. Like if no one's yeah, trademarked it before, like you know. No, and they've 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 gone on to say that you know their trademark isn't malicious. As I said, it's sort of they're only going to they'd only go after someone if they used it. Uh, yeah, how, how did they describe it? If they used it in a, in a sort of more than a vague way, um, I think if you say had a game, if you had a game and you marketed it as set in a cyberpunk universe, they wouldn't go after you for that. Mm. Um, and CD Projekt Red, man, I can't see them going after anyone to be honest. Like that doesn't fit with their brand at all. No, I, I can't imagine. I would, yeah, I, I think it's just to sort of stop someone coming out with mm. a game called Cyberpunk before they. Yeah, yeah, their game yeah. Out, you know? it's almost Definitely, certainly yeah, Cyberpunk yeah. twenty seventy six. They right. won't go after people using it as a descriptor <laughs> just if they use it as a name, probably sort of thing. Like, right, you can right, use right. it as yeah, much no, as you want sense, to yeah. define what and it, you're yeah, doing. Yeah, as you mentioned, Regan, it's already a pen and paper. You know, so this this Cyberpunk game is based off a pen and paper RPG from uh, I think it's from the nineties or something like that. Cyberpunk, uh, I can't remember the actual date, but it's Cyberpunk something something something. Um, so. It's not. It's not even their. You know, it's not even their property kind of thing. So mm. they'd be a bit. It'll be a bit richer than for going after someone else about that. So I think it'll be fine. They yeah. They had a clarification thing which I can link in the show notes saying, hey, well, no, we're not. We're not doing anything. We're not going to do anything wrong. Don't worry, guys. We're we're still cool. CDPR. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're cool, man. We're cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. They are cool. Um. So I mean, the last thing we we really need to talk about, and I've actually lost track as to whose go it is. I really hope it's not mine, is top 10. Uh, I want to say it's Balthazar's turn. Yeah, I I'm, I have a feeling it's your turn as well there, Balthazar. All right, let's whip out the old list. <laughs> See what I got. Your trusty <laughs> list. <laughs> More prepared uh, than anyone else. <laughs> all right, so I still have seven things to choose from. Um, oh, here we go. All right, uh, so <laughs> this uh, this selection from my top ten list is an easy one. Kingdom Under Fire. <laughs> oh, there you go. Nice. There we go. <laughs> Slots in perfectly. Uh, so we already touched on it a bit earlier, uh, and sort of something that I... I talked about when we first started doing these top 10 lists is that we all kind of had this general consensus that these lists were potentially... They weren't necessarily the games that were what we thought were the best games or anything. They were just the games that had the most impact on us and that really resonated with us. And we're like, this is a game that I'm always going to stand by sort of thing. And, you know, it's yep. just up there as what I consider one, one of the best moments in gaming that I've had or what have you. Uh, and so on my list so far, everything bar Vanquish has been a game that I've talked about for doing a particular thing with Vanquish just being that it represented Platinum Games as the first one I played and they're now my favorite dev sort of thing. Uh, So going back to that previous line, Kingdom Under Fire was the first game I played that 
to quote our good friend Peter Molyneux, <laughs> can't have a genre pinned to it. Nice. Um, you know, it it blended relatively seamlessly uh you know a lot of ideas that we were used to from other games uh but we were also just fully used to and expecting what they already delivered so you know an rts was a resource management game where you built up armies and and explored the map and kind of conquered your enemies action third person games were you know running around jumping and and probably some collectibles somewhere uh, and RPGs were big open world, uh, you know, leveling up and, and getting better equipment and stuff. And Kingdom Under Fire took all three of those genres and slapped them together in a way that worked perfectly. So you had the RTS elements of, you know, your missions were, were launched from kind of a hub and you would select your armies out of kind of what you'd raised from yes the resources you'd gained and, and recruits and things but all of your army building and management was done before launching a mission um so it's almost like a 4x game like uh oh help me 4x those eternity games fuck nice anyway um <laughs> yeah you do kind of all your resource management and and you you'd select units and you could follow skill tree path things and things like in rpgs to evolve the units into elite versions you know like you could turn a uh, an infantryman into a cavalry mounted infantryman or a heavy you know knight armor wielding or wearing infantryman and then when you launched your mission you would still have that top down view and you kind of cycle between your different regiments and move them around the map and obviously they all had different areas they would excel in so maybe you you look at the map before you launch the mission and you can see it's a large open area so you choose a lot of cavalry to just kind of run across it and knock people down or you see that there's an area where you're starting off on a hill maybe and the enemy's below you so you might take a lot of fire archers or something to just kind of smoke them out and and have the advantage there but you also had a commander who was your unit who leveled up as you played through and you kind of put points into different attributes and you uh, could buy or obtain through playing better weapons and armor and stuff or, or gear that gave him different abilities to equip. And whenever the unit that the commander was assigned to clashed with another unit, the camera would zoom in on the fight and you would gain control of your commander as a third person action um, sort of hack and slash game where you're running around, you're using your abilities, you're essentially just utterly destroying. Think on a smaller scale, Dynasty Warriors. You are the hero mm. just carving your way right. through hundreds of guys at once. Did it and, sort of like, oh, was that all with an engine? So you were up above, yeah. and you were like doing all your RTS type stuff, and then the camera would literally just zoom down. It would down just onto zoom down. Way. Yeah, whenever. Oh, and cool. so you could, while you were in the fight with that unit, you could swap to a different unit and manage its movement. So maybe he's in a fight and it's starting to turn and you're struggling. So you might rotate to a different unit which is maybe a cavalry unit and and redirect it so that it circles around and then charges through the middle of the fight to you know knock out the, the guys in there and as soon as you switch to the next regime the camera pans out and you kind of get the top down again then when you swap back to the one with the commander and it pans back in on the commander and you you, you resume control there so it really just defied all expectations that have previously been set out by all of those genres um, and just combine them in a really unique, interesting and fun way. And it opened my mind more to giving things that I didn't understand a chance in mm. games, you know. So whether that would be a genre that, you know, I didn't understand how it could work or how it could be fun, just giving it a go. Um, or, you know, it, yeah, really anything at all. Uh, you know, maybe I tried something in the past and it didn't quite gel with me, but then someone else loves it and, you know, I don't understand. And uh, like, yeah. how can you like... What? The, uh, what about it? It's crap. But this I played game, that game kind for of... thirty minutes, and I didn't yeah, enjoy yeah, it. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas this game really opened my mind to just being like, you know, stuff works, you know, in different ways. Uh, I know a lot of people who didn't like Kingdom Under Fire because, you know, maybe they did go into it wanting a standard RTS or what have you, um, and they didn't like how it did that. So it really, I guess, just got me to broaden my mind more and, and acknowledge, pe you know, gaming culture more 
you know, uh, acknowledged that there were others out there who played games, appreciated them for what they did, maybe, you know, disapproved of some for what they did or didn't do. And I guess introduced me more to gaming as, you know, a culture and a community rather than just something I casually did on the weekend sort of thing. Mm. So in a way, yeah, Kingdom Under Fire is the big game that brought me into gaming as opposed to just being a gamer, you know, your classic kind of, if you think to the early 2000s, the gamer being the lonely nerd who sits in the basement playing by himself to you know what gaming has evolved into now where you know everyone games on some level even if it's people just playing you know farmville on their phone like everyone on some level plays yep. these days um and it kind of just through broadening my understanding of genres and and you know enjoyment from different things it basically opened me up to uh accepting that there was a community out there and getting involved with it and essentially becoming a modern, like transcending from a basement <laughs> dwelling uh, gamer to, you know, a member of the gaming community kind sure. of thing. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. That's really nice. Did you, <laughs> how did you stumble into this game, Balthazar? Uh, I judged a book by its cover. It had some cool cover art in Harvey Norman. I saw it on the shelf. Oh, nice. <laughs> just a it classic on... uh, blind buy. Yeah, I saw it, and it wasn't just that. It was uh, the Harvey Norman in P-Town, in, uh, in old Polidua, was yep. uh, closing down. So it was like 20 bucks on classic Xbox. Oh, wow. And I was like, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's, that's a good price. You know, I, it's one that is surprised that I'm willing to lose that money if it turns out to suck. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then it really didn't. And then I, yeah, I, I managed to then back in, you guys remember Gamesman before it was uh, yeah, bought oh, yeah, out by yeah, EB. Yeah, that's old school. Uh, one day was walking, uh, decided to look through the pre-owned section in a Gamesman and saw a copy. So it was Heroes that I got from Harvey Norman. And then after playing that, I found out that it was actually a sequel to The Crusades, um, which was also on classic Xbox, but like I, nobody had heard anything about kind of thing. It was really, it was a rare find. And yeah. I found it in a pre-owned section in a Gamesman. Um so yeah, was really lucky to acquire both of those. Strange circumstances for both of them, um, but yeah, no, really cool games. And if anyone out there does, you know, ever see one, you know, I know you, Abe, are a bit of a, you know, uh, you enjoy looking in, you know, kind of pre-owned areas and <laughs> yes. things like Snooping the op shop and stuff. Places. If you go past it, just decrepit little weird exactly, shops. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And if you do ever happen to stumble across one of them, uh, definitely pick it up. And if it's on a platform that you can get your hands on to try out, I think uh, yeah, it's definitely worth it. Awesome, man. Was was that out on on? So it was on PC and original Xbox. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and you can still the PC one's obviously easier to track down. Um, the original Kingdom Under Fire. Uh, there's a gold edition with all the expansions included. You can pick that up on PC fairly easily. Mm. Um, but the Crusades and Heroes, I believe, might have been a classic Xbox exclusive. And then I believe there was a really shitty 360 one like where they just went pure RPG and removed the RTS aspect, but apparently they went kind of tried to go maybe JRPG with it and it got really weird and nobody liked it. And that was disheartening. <laughs> I never tried it. <laughs> but I have full faith in two and they better resurrect it on Scorpio. Mm. Well, it's uh, it looks like it's it's coming, doesn't it? Like I've done The it. website's still there. It's yeah. still... <laughs> but it's been in that same state for about three years. So, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's... yeah it used to be my homepage. There back in the date like fucking what 2000 at least 2010 we're talking at least seven years ago um and then i noticed that it hadn't updated for like a year so i stopped stopped yeah, visiting it, it. it actually looking at the their website it actually looks like a website from like the early to mid 2000s like, yeah right when the web was starting to become a little more dynamic and a little more interesting and they yeah. were still trying to figure it out but it yeah <laughs> Oh it's, yes, uh, I, I see. I see this website. Yes, it looks very RuneScape. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah. It's a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you look, like considering the age that that the stuff is, if you actually look at the screenshots and stuff, that was going to be a good looking game for yeah. back yeah, in the day. It yeah. is. So I'm still keen. They can easily game. resurrect it and make it really nice. Do it. Mm. <laughs> you guys should watch the trailer for it as well. That obviously I just saw the trailer pop up. The extended trailer yeah. from 2014. <laughs> Nice. Dude, this is like this is it's got to be like a 
you know, three yeah. months away at this yeah. point. Has like, to. Right? <laughs> it's turning into a Last Guardian situation. E3, it's going to be. You even realize it. It's going to be like one of those weird, uh, you know, those Japanese releases where at, at E3 they're going to show up and be like, King on Fire 2 on shelves now. Mm. Just <laughs> like, yeah, totally. the, old sh- the old shadow drop. Yeah, yeah. So, I can see um, this. Balthazar's got this real sort of like hopeful, <laughs> slightly desperate look in his eye yeah. when he's talking about it. Uh, it's, um, it's good stuff. Uh, ah. Yeah. But yeah, no, Kingdom Under Fire, number uh, four on my list of top ten. Well, they're not numbered, but you know, my fourth entry into my top ten. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very nice, man. That's awesome. Well, I think uh, I'll whiz through some release dates really quickly, and that'll be the end of our show for another fortnight, unfortunately. Uh, but this is what's out right now. This, we're coming into, what is it, mid mid to late April kind of thing. So we've got uh, Telltale's Guardians of the Galaxy, episode one came out uh, it should have been yesterday for us but it will be today if the dates match up sort of thing uh the 18th of april in the states we've also got the disney afternoon collection which is a whole bunch of crazy wee games like ducktales and all that sort of stuff uh remastered from the snes and uh and you know older early 90s systems i think uh, awesome <laughs> yeah i don't know that might be kind of fun a little little archaic platformer might might have to look into that one myself uh we've also got full throttle ah, full throttle remastered that's really hard to say uh which is the double fine tim schaefer game that's similar to um uh you know broken age it's, it's one of those point and click adventure type things um broken age and grim fandango and all that sort of thing full throttle yeah, remastered does not sound like a point and click game eh? like it no it really it sounds like it sounds like a racing game yeah, it's it the second like charlie's the angels movie yeah mm. it's a it's a game about uh a, a bikey so there was a, is a vehicle element to it uh you know you're you're a bikey like um what's his name from lost in the damned but i've never played that so i'm kind of interested to pick it up although it is again probably going to have the curse of the early double fine games where there is a lack of logic and i just end up pixel spamming and clicking everything Mm, yeah um doesn't sound that fun but uh, i don't know it might be all right and on april 25th we have what remains of edith finch which is a weird looking game i don't really know how to even i don't even really know what this game is to be honest you can go look up the trailer i just you know send me an email if you know what this game is because i bloody <laughs> did well don't but it looks intriguing it looks very abstract and i'm all about that sort of weird pretentious crap so um you know fuck me through an email if you, if you know what what remains of edith finch is or what you're doing it and we've also got outlast 2 uh balthazar which you're pretty interested in i think yeah i'll probably pick it up i like the first yep. one nice one nice one i've also well, got um, an announcement actually um Ooh, Reagan. <laughs> we may or may, may or may not release uh a game called the unpainted world mm. um First game, overcast yeah game, game. game designed by uh by balthazar valentine and dev by myself so watch out on the uh the playstation and xbox stores coming to you soon that's all yeah. i'll say Already well, greenlit if, if on the Steam. Life of the Black Tiger can uh, can get through, <laughs> then surely, surely this can. Sure, surely the unpainted world can make it. It won't make it. Uh, we we can we can try we can try. <laughs> if if not the PlayStation Store, then uh, Dropbox. <laughs> 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 pop it up there but uh i'm afraid that's uh that's bring us to the end of another overcast gamer show for a fortnight so we will see you again in two weeks and do you guys want a parting words sign off anything you want to do <laughs> nice one yeah uh yeah have a good week two weeks everyone two week? yeah, yeah yeah we'll see you again in a fortnight ciao Kaki tip. <laughs> Um, I can vaguely hear that noise. Yeah.